I will talk about multivariate analysis because um, this is um, something I've been working on for the past 15 years now, um, where we're really trying to shift this one gene hypothesis paradigm uh, by using those methods. So I will talk a lot about combinations of markers or combination of parameters that we measure rather than univariate markers, which are usually identified with univariate statistical tests. So for example, if you do a t-test or if you do an ANOVA test, you run it per gene. And so you completely ignore the interaction the, the, between different genes or the, the correlation or the association. I'll show you how these methods can be used for uh, dimensional reduction um, and how they can be extended then to integrate different layers of information. And I also mentioned um, that we can also do supervised analysis or classification using those methods. So I first uh, start with uh, one of the workhorse uh, of multivariate analysis, which is principal component analysis, and then we're going to go through more advanced methods. So uh, PCA, uh, principal component analysis, is, um, as I said, it's a workhorse for multivariate statistical analysis. I, I use it all the time when I have a big data set, even when it's small. Uh, because I want to understand first what is the quality of the data, what is the signal I can extract from it, um, what is the data structure, are there things that I didn't anticipate to get from the data? For example, is there any um, you know, source of variation that are due to batch effects or experimental mishap or whatever? PCA is very good to tell you, to give you a snapshot of your data into something that is much better for us to uh, interpret. Um, so in PCA, what we do is uh, we replace the original uh, variables, so the parameters we measure, by new variables, and I'll show you how we do that. And those new variables are called principal components. And they, those principal components are supposed to summarize as much information as possible from your original data set, but in a much reduced dimensional space. Um, and in PCA, uh, this information is actually the variance that we get from the data. So I'll give you, um, I'll give you some example here about what a linear combination of variables is. So assume we've measured two variables, height and weight, in 10 individuals. Um, but instead of looking at the height and the weight, I'm going to combine them. So you can take the average if you want. And then uh, in that case, you would assign a coefficient that is 0 0.5 to each of them. You know? um, or you can do another combination of coefficients. So here, for example, I decided to apply the coefficient 0 0.5 to height and a coefficient of 2 to weight, because I say, well, actually, I think weight is more important than height for the problem I have to deal with. Um, so you can calculate that. This is basic algebra. Um, and you get a, a linear combination where for each individual, instead of having two values, you end up with only one because you've combined them with those coefficients. And so this linear combination is a component. Um, so you can do that very efficiently now. We have algorithm in R and other um, you know, languages to do that. Uh, but really, the challenge is that how do you define what is the, the coefficient you assign? How do you decide that? Um, I can show you another example that is a bit more, um, that is larger. Um, so here we have still 10 individuals, and this time I've measured five variables. If you uh, plug that into a PCA, you're going to obtain something that looks very similar to the, or the, this data set. Uh, you still have your 10 individuals, but this time you have those principal components. And I as a, I want to remind you that a principal component will be a linear combination of those five variables, so it looks different from the original data, um, and that they will replace completely your original data set. Um, and those principal components are designed to explain as much information as possible. Um, because we're interested in dimension reduction, meaning that we don't want five variables, that's way too many. We want maybe one or two variables. And so we may only consider, for example, the first two components and say that's it. That's enough. It will explain as much information as I'm happy with from this data set and therefore have reduced the dimension of my data from five to two. 
Um, what the, so I talk about information and variance. Um, if you calculate the covariance of your original data, this is what you get. Okay, so you have on the diagonal, you have the variance of each variable. And uh, outside the diagonal, you have the covariance, which is very similar to a measure of correlation. So um, covariance, so the a correlation is between minus one and plus one, it's bounded. Covariance is between minus infinity and plus infinity. That's the difference. Um, so if I calculate the variance of my data set, basically what I do is I add up all the variances um, of all the variables, and I get a value of 3.27. That's the variance of my data. If I do the same, so if I go back to my PCA result here, um, and I calculate the covariance, um, if I add up all the variances on the diagonal, I get exactly the same value as before. That's why I'm saying we're trying to extract as much variance as possible. And then we say, oh, but actually, you know, the amount of variance explained in the later components is not, it's very small. So I'm not going to consider that. I think it's just noise. And so you may end up with principal component one and two, and you will explain as much as you want. Uh, as much var variance or information as you want. And the other thing that is interesting here is that the covariance values outside the diagonal are all zeros. And that's because the way we design those linear combination of our bones is such that they don't explain the same thing. And so I come back to that concept of principal components are orthogonal, but basically they are in order to extract as much information as we can, it's not useful for us to re-explain again and again the same information. OK, so I talk about matrix decomposition technique. I told you that you could uh, summarize a data set using those components. And basically, that's what we're trying to do here. Um, so you have your original data set here. You have the samples in rows and metabolites or genes in columns. I explained to you that you can extract several components and they will summarize the information from your data. And I also told you that um, in order to uh, obtain those linear combination of variables, you need to know what are the coefficients assigned to each variables. And those are actually stored in something called a loading vector. So for each component, we, obtain, we have one loading vector, and each loading vector is going to tell us, well, the coefficient for variable one is this, the coefficient for variable two is this, and so on. Um, and so, as I said, the hardest part is actually to find the loading uh, vector. Once you have this, the rest, you know, you can calculate your combination and so on. And so this is done um, statistically. We um, optimize, basically, we, we, um, we've, we, estimate those coefficients by asking to maximize the variance of each of those components. So this is done automatically um, in those methods. Um, and one of the trick of PCA is to decide how many components do I need? Do I need two, three, 10? Um, so you, you probably, if some of you have used PCA before, you've seen that kind of graph. It's actually a bar plot where each component, um, each bar represents the amount of variance that is explained per component. So for example, this one explains about 60% of the total variance. And then the second one explains about, I don't know, 15% or so. And you can see it decreases. That by, uh, by construction, the amount of explained variance will decrease across the components. And so you can choose, for example, one component, or you can choose two or three, and so on. Um, so there's no clear uh, decision making, like there's no uh, clear method to, to de decide how many components you need. It's very uh, arbitrary. So the first one is you say, well, you know, I look at this and it obviously decreases, so I don't need five. From five to 10, I'm not going to explain anything, but it's probably noise. But then uh, do, you, do you include number two, three, and four, for example? So one um, 
you know, practical method is we use the elbow method. So basically when it kind of sharpens and flattens is where we should stop. Um, the other one is also to look at the proportion of explained variants. So it's, you add them up. So for example, if you use one principal component analysis, well, sorry, one principal component, you explain about 60% of the variants of the original data. You could say, well, that's enough for me because I know my data set is very noisy anyway. If you um, include the second components, then you add up what you've explained on the first component and the second component, and you get about 0 0.75. And you might say, okay, that's enough. So either you use the elbow method, and in that case, I would use only one component. Or you can say, well, actually, with one component, uh, the visualization is going to be very hard, because we're going to have 1D visualization, so maybe you want two. So there's a bit of uh, you know, um, soft touch on how you choose those components. But just remember that PCA is an explorative method. So you're not saying, you're not inferring anything from a PCA uh, output. You're just saying, this is what I can see from the data. This is the, um, these are the sources of variation I can uh, interpret um, from this data. Um, there are statistical tests to actually just help you to decide the number of components, but I wouldn't advise you use them because they have a lot of, um, they're very limited uh, for big data. Okay, so um, you can look at the, so this is a PCA sample plot of a very, um, you know, a toy example, where here the samples that were measured, so in the rows, are different type of fruit, and then the, the variables, or the parameters that we measured are different characteristics of the fruit, you know, for example, the texture, the acidity, and so on. So if you take that data set and you plug it into PCA, you would obtain a plot like this, it's called a sample plot, so the fruit are my samples. Um, and basically, how we obtain this plot is we, print, we, um, we plot component one versus component two. So just remember, before you had a very, say we have a thousand characteristics of this fruit, we reduce it down to only two components. Um, and then we uh, just plot those two components. And it can be seen as projecting your data into a much smaller space, which is a space of only created by those two components. Um, but remember that we have each of those components a uh, linear combination of all those characteristics. So we still retain that information. And often, um, depending on you know, the, um, your data, often those components have some sort of meaning. So for example, here, um, the, the, the major source of variation that has been extracted from those components is how um, easy or difficult uh, a fruit is to eat. So that would be the meaning of the first component, so the, the horizontal, the x-axis. And the second meaning of uh, the component would be how tasty and tasty it is for humans. Um, so usually they have a meaning like that. And so you can see, for example, oh, all these fruits are actually easy and tasty, and all these fruits are you know, difficult and not tasty, for example. So this is how you can start to um, interpret your sample plot. Um, the other plot that people don't know much about, but I think it's uh, useful to mention, is um, uh, how you represent the variables. Because at the moment, I only show you the samples, I show you the principal components, but what actually happens inside the PCA so that uh, we understand better what is the correlation between the variables. And so for that, we use uh, a plot called correlation circle plot, where basically we calculate the correlation between each variable and each principal component. So for example, here, I calculate the correlation between my variable xj and the first component. And I do the same for the second component. And then I plot it. Because it's a correlation, uh, my circle will be of radius 1. And basically, it ends up here in the plot. OK, so that's, that's what we do. Um, but what is interesting is if you do that for um, all the variables you have. So here, I'd only show you four of them. Um, and basically, it's going to tell me that um, x1 and y1 um, are highly correlated together. So basically, I look at the, the angle 
between those two arrows. And that angle, if I take the cosine value of that angle, it's going to tell me how correlated they are. So I can start to say, oh, OK, x1 and y1, those two variables are highly positively correlated together. If you have a flat angle like this, it means that x1 and x2 are negatively correlated together, but they're strongly negatively correlated together. And then if you have a right angle like the y1 and y2, it means that they are not correlated together. So when you have variables that are not correlated together, it means that y1 contributes heavily to the definition of principal component 1, the x-axis. But y1 doesn't contribute at all to the definition of principal component 2, um, whereas y2 is the inverse. It, it contributes to component 2, but it doesn't contribute to component 1. So if you see the, the coordinate, basically, tell us that. So you can start to um, understand you know, the correlation structure of your data set. And that's very relevant in biology because we know that a lot of genes are correlated and we know also that a lot of genes are not correlated. And how do we visualize that into a you know, smaller dimensional space? Um, when you have a lot of variables like this, um, we remove the arrow. So you will just see the name, often you will see the name of the variable. So you kind of have to do intellectually, mentally, you have to draw those arrows and kind of uh, work out roughly the, the, the angle between them. Um, and another plot that is probably not well known is the biplot. And basically, it combines a sample plot and the correlation circle plot that I showed you before. So the sample plot, as I, I told you, tell us more about the samples, how similar they are together, you know, what, what, this, what, um, what is the source of variation that explain why they're different. Uh, the correlation circle plot is going to tell us um, you know, how correlated the variables are in that reduced space. And the biplot is going to overlay those two plots. So you will have at the back, you have all your samples. And in the front, in red, you have your variables. So for example, here, uh, you have a lot of melanoma samples. Um, and you have a set of uh, transporter, multi-drug transporters um, or drugs that are highly correlated together, so that's why they're clump, but they're also pointing towards the melanoma samples. So that's going to tell you that potentially um, those transporters may have a high expression in melanoma and a low expression in the other samples. So this is a kind of interpretation you need to work on. You need to uh, you know, use additional um, visualization in order to get that, but that's what the PCA can tell you as well. Okay, so this was um, you know, an introduction to PCA and telling you a little bit more about what's happening in PCA. Also going through some not less well-known visualization techniques such as the correlation circle plot and the biplot. 